And with that, we're going to move on to the, the, the next presenter, which is um, Greg Hodges, speaking on airborne geophysics. Greg Hodges is a senior geophysicist with Sander Geophysics in Ottawa. Greg has been a geophysicist for almost 38 years as a contractor and a junior in major mining companies and doing most kinds of ground borehole and airborne geophysics. He has been doing almost exclusively airborne geophysics for the last 23 years, including 19 years as chief geophysicist at Digim Fugro CGG before joining Sander two years ago. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Greg. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Uh, thanks. I'd like to start by acknowledging my, my co-author, Asbjorn Christensen. Asbjorn promised me, I don't know if he's here this morning. There you are. You promised me to send me your logo. Um, which I was, would put on here, so I unfortunately didn't get it. So if you see uh, Asbjorn around, ask him to see a copy of his corporate logo, because it's supposed to be on here. Okay, uh, start off, really, with safety, of course. It's, it's, it's core to everything, or, or leads everything we do. Um, and the formation of AGS uh, happened, I think, around 2000. And you notice the accidents, the number of accidents went down from about 12 and 2000, Around about 2003, they were down to just a couple a year, two to four, and it stayed pretty steady since. Conversely, the number of incidents reported went from about two in 2008 up to about 20, and these are all per 100,000 hours of flying. The number of AGSA members has gone up over about the same time, up to about 30. Uh, sorry, the number of members who report, so we have more incidents reported and more members reporting, um, but the total number of members in AGSA, which is the, the Airborne Geophysics Safety Association, is about the same, which is a really nice set of numbers because it tells you there's a lot less accidents and there's a lot more reporting of the accidents. So um, the number of reporting, the amount of reporting doesn't depend on how many accidents or doesn't show more accidents. So it's really good. Um, here's the number of flight hours that are reported to AGSA. Of course, uh, airborne contractors being cagey lot don't tell a lot about how much money they're making. But the pattern, and if you look at some of the reports on expiration expenditures, you'll see the exact same pattern repeated. You could actually uh, match them one for one. So 2011 was a great year, and now in 2016, we're flying less than we have in, in decades. Um, so very poor, very poor decline. I'm not going to prognosticate business. Uh, I take a guess at geophysics. That's easier than business. Um, but it's an interesting story, almost 20 years now since Fugro basically tried to buy everybody and capture the market. Uh, they obviously had no understanding of the wild free enterprise in our market because there's more suppliers now than there ever were. Um, so it's changed, Th those who have changed, but a lot of the small players, uh, they're all still around. Very few have disappeared, but they're uh, fairly, you know, they're, they're low overhead companies. They can stay alive in, in tough times. Some other changes in the business side, high-speed internet has really changed a lot. It's now possible to take the processing out of the field and move it to the office. That's seen by some as a cost savings, but it's really more important that if the processor, the, call him a field processor, he might be dedicated to the job, he's sitting in the office, he's got decades of expertise around him for any problems that come up, he's got all the computing power of the office at hand. It really does make sense in this day and age not to have one guy with a laptop out in the field. Um, more advanced processing right now, a lot of it third parties, you can buy more processing software. It used to be we all wrote our own inversion software, but the complexity of the software available has sort of risen beyond the point where most contractors are going to write their own. And some other changes, there's now rental, more rental equipment than it used to be. Uh, rental gravity, all of the gravity systems, you'll see, sorry, no, not all of them, many of them are, um, and even heavy time domain equipment. So I'll go over each of the types of airborne geophysics uh, fairly briefly. Magnetic, of course, has been around for a very long time. It's mostly a commodity, meaning the, the data you get, the data collected will be very similar. There's different uh, sort of attention to quality in different companies on the, the processing, and that can come and go with jobs. There's standard sensors. Um, the noise limit is really, it's the ambient, it's outside the sensor, it's the aircraft itself and the noise. So, although there's super high-res sensors out there, if your noise envelope from your aircraft is a, a tenth of a nanotesla, there's no great value in having uh, a picotesla sensitivity in your sensor. So, a lot of it is very similar, and that, again, makes it more commodity-based. Um, MAG is an optimal sensor size, as we'll see when we talk a bit later about UAVs and drones. 
The one new development fairly recently is a squid-based uh, mag sensor gradiometer. So it's a, a vector gradiometer. Angle de Beers has been developing it with Spectrum, but as far as we know, it's still only in, available in-house uh, at those companies. Gamma ray spectrometry, also pretty close to being a commodity. Uh, there's certainly been incremental changes, mostly in the electronics. The crystals, they're the same crystals have been used for, for decades, and they're actually just attaching new electronics to a lot of them. So you get better channel resolution. We've gone from 256 up to 1024. They're more stable, which means you get better calibration more easily. Uh, reduced dead time. A lot of mapping jobs, that doesn't matter, but if you're into high signal areas, it will. And you can actually get modest directional sensing. If you've got four crystals and you can process them separately, you can actually get a, 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 an idea where, which direction the target might be. And, but the sensitivity is largely limited by the volume of crystals. It's, they're pretty good at capturing photons if you've got it thick enough, and there's not a lot you can do. Um, certainly some people like Medusa are producing cesium iodide instead of the standard sodium iodide. Little better capture ratio, little more robust, but you just can't beat these large volume sensors really. And then some of these small sensors now, um, we're seeing them start to appear as sort of new developments on uh, unmanned systems or uh, drones used for directionality, but certainly the opinion amongst those who are sort of responsible about their opinions is these small crystals won't be very good for mapping because they don't have the sensitivity for sort of non-radioactive targets, but they certainly will be used for engineering work. Under airborne gravity now, they've certainly progressed over the years in a boring way in that they're now pretty routine. Uh, they're not nearly as magical as they were 10 years ago. Um, and a lot of the advances now are in signal processing to try and reduce noise of the air grav from standard geophysics. The GT1A has, I think, progressed to the GT2A, which is quite a bit better for micro, Canadian microgravity, and the TAG system. So those are the three that are available. The first one is standard, only the other two are available for rent by anybody who wants to fly the gravity survey. One new development quite recently, sort of in the hardware side, is the, the first three component vector gravity survey. Uh, it was flown by Sander Geophysics. So you're measuring the vertical, which is the obvious, as well as two horizontal vectors. Should be useful for interpretation. Uh, I think it was used actually for geodetic survey as well. Gravity gradiometry is sort of a newer kid on the block. Um, the digital Falcon and the full tensor gravity, they're both made by Lockheed Martin. They've gone digital, so they've reduced the size of the, and the, uh, the noise in the systems, improved the data quality. But also important in the case of Falcon, it's now small enough to fit into a helicopter. And helicopters fly lower and slower than fixed wing, so that's a good way to uh, uh, get better signal. And also helicopters are better at following terrain, so all that has lended to much higher resolution uh, than was, was previously possible. CGG's also added a strap-down gravity meter because the gradiometer, of course, isn't really good at the, the long wavelength, big, deep targets. So they've added a, a strap-down gravity meter to try and combine the two systems. And I think that's definitely the way of the future. Full tensor gravity systems that's flown by, uh, by Bell and Austin Bridgeport. Their full tensor processing now, they do that. So they measure all the tensors, they process them all together, reduces the noise. The FTG was also implemented on a Zeppelin, and we'll visit that again, because it's pretty significant. Uh, an airship is an ideal platform. They fly low, they fly slow, um, but the, sort of the, the lesson learned here, the, the aircraft was caught by a storm and destroyed. And so UAVs are very interesting new technology, but there's practical problems with them. There's a few instrument advances on the threshold. There's lots of people, and there have been lots of people working on airborne gravity gradiometers for decades, but it's a very complex problem. Lockheed Martin is promising their next generation to reduce the noise, I think, by at least half, or, or improve signal noise. And then the long-awaited JetX AGG is actually flying its first commercial survey. Um, we've heard about it for a long time, um, but it's now flying. I threw a picture in there. It's a, it's a super cooled system. It, it's not steam powered like it looks in that picture, but it's a lovely picture of it anyways. And an interesting thing, I just uh, found the, the last ETS, all of the airborne gravity gradiometers are ITAR restricted, which means uh, State Department in the US controls where they can go and there's certain countries they can't. None of the airborne gravity sensors are ITAR restricted. So it's, uh, it can be an issue depending on where you want to fly your survey. VLF, also a system that's been around a long time, that's a very low frequency, using uh, 
used to be U.S. Navy transmitters. It's rarely flown now, um, but it is still available. Almost everybody has an old TOTAM system that they could put out there. Limited use, if you're flying EM anyways, then the EM you take with you is generally better. And there's problems with uh, the U.S. Navy doesn't care so much about their transmitters, so they're a little less reliable than they used to be. And you don't want to shut down for a day just because somebody's decided he's got to change the vacuum tubes in an old ELF transmitter. The exception to this is the XDS and now the new variation, the digital matrix, uh, called matrix with Paraquest. It's an all-channel, multi-component, as or measures everything type VLF, um, which they fly as an add-on to other surveys, I think is a, a really good idea because it sort of costs you nothing to add it on there. And there's also now a VLF uh, available on a, a drone or UAS system from MGT. Uh, that's quite new, sort of, I think still experimental. Passive EM, it's interesting. It's been around quite a while now. The, the Z10 from Geotech, though, is the only one that's out there. Um, You've got a Z component receiver and an XY base station, uh, which if you know MT means you can only measure the, the tipper, um, which is a, a very effective but, but less sensitive than full MT. So it's nothing like full MT, but it's still quite effective, and it's airborne, which is the advantage. Um, they're the only ones who've produced it. Nobody's decided to challenge them in that market. Um, fairly recently, or more recently, available on fixed wing. It's always been a helicopter system, as shown on the left. Uh, the one on the right is a fixed wing. I would interpret it as not having been very successful because they have many uh, helicopter systems, but only the one fixed wing system. Fixed wing frequency domain EM is an older type of system as well, and one that's generally gone out of, uh, out of fashion, if we can call it that. The only one that's flying right now is the Sanders SIGFEM system. Um, and you can see the wingtip system, the EM systems mounted on the wingtips. This used to be a, a, a Finnish system, um, but it's, they're very fast because it's fixed wing. They have a high resistivity range they can map because of frequency domain. So it's a good mapping tool. Um, and at Sander, it's under a very thorough modernization. A newer development is uh, the EM4H from Geotechnologies. Hasn't been around as long. It's a real, there's that in their equator, a real catch everything systems. They can be on fixed wing or helicopter. Um, in this case, it's a toad bird frequency domain system. The problem is then you've got to correct for geometry between the transmitter receiver. That's done with a, uh, a separate EM field to try and get the positioning, but it's a real problem. It's very difficult to do, and it really limits the, uh, the sensitivity of the system. Uh, much less sensitivity or much less signal noise compared to uh, most frequency domain EM systems. Helicopter frequency domain is another one that's been around quite a while, some of the older systems. Now it's mostly the Digimon Resolve, they're the ones that uh, the most systems and the most advanced systems on the market. The tune coil systems, five or six frequencies, there's two or more, or two geometries in, in each. Um, really ideal for high resolution EM surveys, a uh, very high range of resistivity as well. So if you want to get up into the 20s and 30,000 ohm meter, you've got to have one of these systems, but they don't have the depth of expiration that uh, miss, many systems do now. And they haven't really shown any advances in more than 10 years. So the systems are there, they work for their particular market. But there's still a few even older ones or smaller ones around, like the hummingbirds that were made by McFar and sold or, or rented out years ago. Uh, they're small, I would call them low-tech systems compared to the uh, Digim Resolve. And there's Gem 2As from, they were made by GeoFX, GeoFX bought by AeroQuest, or and then that was bought by Geo. So I don't know if they, you can get them. Geotech owns them now. Um, Their broadband systems also low powered compared to the others. And there is one new player out there, the Atlas system from Precision Geo Surveys. It's also a, a broadband uh, programmable, so it's only got one set of coils or broadband coils. You can program it to what frequencies, which generally means they're lower power. And again, this EM4H from Geotechnologies, which can be fixed wing or helicopter, and it still has the same problem of uh, positioning. Fixed wing time domain M is interesting. It's a, a, a senior system, been around a long time, but really a declining field, uh, challenged mostly by the heli time domain M systems, which we'll talk about next. The big beast that was around a long time, the Megatam 2 from CGG, used to be the most powerful EM uh, on a fixed wing or on a four-engine aircraft. I would characterize it as being in palliative care now. Uh, you're not likely to ever see it fly again. Um, 
no contractor ever wants to say, no, we don't do that anymore, but uh, certainly my interpretation. CGG's also basically pulled their geotem line. We saw some geotem data from Dennis. Um, and they're focused really on the Tempest, which is a small fixed wing time domain EM system, about 60,000 meters squared. And then the other player, the other one that's been around a while is Spectrum. They have a, a fixed wing time domain system on a Bassler, I guess it is. Um, but only one of those systems. So although it's an effective system, unfortunately, with only one on the market, it's pretty hard to get a hold of it. One new player, uh, just in development now, it's not flown commercially yet, is, uh, well, they're calling it the ZAG-M for now, which is a tough sort of a name from Excalibur, and it's fit on a, an AGCAT, that small uh, crop dusting aircraft. Modest power at this point. Um, it's not going to challenge the big helicopter time domain systems for, for exploration for deep targets. Um, so it'll compete with the Tempest type small fixed wing time domain systems for mapping type work, I'm sure. And then heli time domain. Uh, interesting one. It hasn't been around more than, well, 17 years, it, almost 20, I suppose, for, since first development. Despite the abysmal market that we're in, it's unbelievable how many systems there are and they're still being developed. I don't know if it's because there's more people with time on their hands to develop these things, but um, there's still lots. There's more than 25 different systems out there, uh, probably more than all other airborne geophysical systems put together, so I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, it would take quite a bit of time. Um, but the Holly Time Domain compared to the big fixed wing systems, it's lower cost to build it, to own it. You don't have to have an aircraft sitting there and a lot easier to mobilize if you have to send it across an ocean that you can just pack it up and ship it instead of having to try and fly these aircraft across. They have more power and better resolution than the fixed wing systems, which is why they work so well. Um, and there's a lot of time domain EM expertise, both in the industry building the systems and in people processing and using them. An interesting change, it was always this race to having the biggest, most powerful time domain EM system, up to over 2 million amp meters squared for the transmitter. That really seems to have died off now. People have, have quit bragging about how much power they have, and now they're trying to get better signal to noise out of the, the instruments they have. The big players, Geotech is probably the biggest. They have, uh, they've been working on, on higher power systems, although they seem to be stopped playing that up so much because CGG stopped playing up their power. And they've also developed some lightweight systems so they can fly in the mountains a little bit better. And a lot of work on signal processing to exchange, extend the range of sensitivity uh, to weak and strong conductors. CGG, they're kind of letting go the, the push to the highest power and gone to transmitter-centered receivers, more like the, uh, the geotech systems. They've got the multipulse, which has... Uh, a big and a little pulse to try and get strong and weak conductors. And as well, fairly recently announced that they can go to 15 hertz, which is to get below 30 or 25 hertz has been the goal for decades in, in airborne EM, and uh, they seem to have done it. And then the third player, SkyTem, they came out of the, the water market. They've always had very accurate equipment and very accurate processing. They've now, to try and compete with these other systems, pushed more towards higher speed, more efficient operation and drop their smallest system that they had, which probably wasn't any better than a frequency domain system. These are the big players, and you can see really what they're doing is they're trying to grow, gain market share really just by broadening what their systems can do. Some new players, the equator I mentioned already, it's a, a time domain where they also process frequency domain out of it, can work on fixed domain helicopter. Excite from NRG, it's an interesting one, that's the picture here. That structure is inflatable, so it holds itself semi-rigid just by uh, air pressure within these tubes. And an interesting sort of bit of a history is the Gemini that was developed by the, uh, the team at RMIT. They had the transmitter receiver on separate aircraft. And that's an idea that was tried many decades ago, but what changed that made their work better is we now have dual frequency GPS. We can position the two aircraft relative to each other within probably centimeters over hundreds of meters. It worked. Uh, but it was never commercial. I would say it's probably because you've got to have twice as many aircraft out there flying your survey. Something that's been around for years is getting induced polarization data from time domain EM data. Um, but the recent rush in just the last few years is actually to commercialize and say, well, darn it, we're measuring it. We're, it's interfering. It was always removed from data as a nuisance. Um, so now it's a product. And basically, you take the decay curve and try and fit conductivity and IP models to curves to one uh, original decay curve, and if you throw in superparamagnetism, you got a third curve. 
That's very tricky to do um, in, in complex geology. So it works, the math works, you get an IP result out. Biggest problem really is prediction. We don't, we can't say this geology will give us char this chargeability along with this uh, connectivity. So it's very hard to use it if you can't predict when you're gonna see it. And at present, there's no airborne EM system that has yet been designed to enhance the IP effect. That will probably come along. Another type of system that's been around for years and, and comes and goes is airborne ground systems or air ground hybrids. You put a big transmitter usually on the ground and then fly your receiver around. On the left, I've listed the advantages to it. You've got a big transmitter, is a ground type advantage, lots of depth. You cover the ground fast, you can have a, a, a receiver that's too heavy for a person to carry, and you can fly up and down bad terrain quite well. So those are the advantages, but with those, unfortunately, comes the disadvantages of each. On ground, you've got the problem of loop layout, you've got to have a crew to do that. You can try and do it by helicopter, but it means your helicopter's not collecting data. And you can't go very far from your transmitter, as opposed to an airborne survey where you take your transmitter with you. The airborne disadvantages to these hybrid systems are logistics. You've got to have now a helicopter and pilots and aircraft maintenance engineers out on the job. And you've got a short time on station. The advantage of ground geophysics is you can plunk yourself down for 10 minutes, 20 minutes if you need to, to stack data. You can't do that if you're flying by at uh, 100 knots. Systems that are around, Graytem is one that's been around for a while in Japan. Uh, just a standard time domain large loop or wire transmitter system, but I don't know if they've ever done anything outside of Japan. And quite new is the SAM, the sub-audio magnetic system. It's a very high power system. You get true B field, but that's done with the cesium magnetometer, so you get total field. You don't get vector, which is a bit of a limitation I'm sure they're going to work on. And they're also talking about putting it on a drone. I mentioned airships and hybrids. It's an idea that's been around a long time. Um, they're lots of lift, they're very stable, they fly slow and low. This is just ideal for doing geophysics. But they're also very expensive. Um, they're slow, which is good for data, but bad for uh, economics. Uh, they tend to be fragile, and uh, there's a real problem with weather. You can't, well, we just had an aircraft, we had to nip it into a hangar because it was a hurricane coming. You can't do it with one of these unless you've got a special hangar. Um, and the one that De Beers uh, built with the FTG on it was destroyed by a sudden uh, thunderstorm. So the future of these is going to depend an awful lot on development that's out of our, our control. Basically, if they make better systems and make them uh, cheaper. All-in-one systems have been around quite a long time. Been tried. Gravity and EM is, is the big challenge there. Gamma spectrometry and mag can, all, can always be put onto almost anything. No one that I know of offers hyperspectral with all these other systems. So BHP Billiton put the Falcon gravity gradiometry and the Resolve EM on one helicopter system. Worked well, got wonderful data, was really nice to work with, but it was very fuel efficient. All this load meant the helicopter couldn't fly for a long time. CGG had their Griffin system with the Falcon gradiometer and the big Megatem EM system. Also wasn't a commercial success. Maybe it was a Cadillac system in uh, uh, Volkswagen budgets that we have these days. Um, and right now, there's no available aircraft again. Nobody wants to say it's gone, but it's kind of like Monty python is that I'm not dead yet. Oh, yes, you are. So the ones that are on offer right now, none of them, I would say, are continuously operational. It's the Spectrum. Uh, they offer the TAGS gravity and their time domain EM. Standard Geophysics offers the AirGrav gravity system and frequency domain EM in the Twin Otter. And Geotem is working right now with the GT2A and their Z10 passive EM on a helicopter. These are all gravity systems, interesting enough. There's no gravity gradiometry systems being offered, and that may be because of the different costs between those two. And then there's drones. A lot of energy, lots of people talking about it. Oh, it's so exciting. There's so much going on. Our biggest limitation for exploration is regulations. They still have to be within line of sight, and there's a size limitation that really limits the payload they can carry. There's lots of mag systems being worked on. It doesn't take much to get a, a drone and stick a magnetometer on. It doesn't take much money. Um, I've mentioned the gamma spectrometry ones by Medusa and RSI. Um, they're too small, they figure, for expiration. They won't have the sensitivity. And MGT has got a VLF system. Payload is probably too small for uh, standard EM or even gravity systems for a long time yet, except maybe the, the, air, the ground airborne hybrid, which is what Graytem is trying and Sam is planning to do too. 
So at this point, they're mostly replacing ground geophysics, not airborne geophysics, because of the limit in the, the range. Newsflash, though, uh, quite recently, a Chinese government agency flew a major survey with a UAV, a mag survey, in Zambia. I guess the Chinese didn't put any regulatory constraint on it, and Zambia didn't put any constraint on it, um, so they could do it. And it's going to be a real challenge or disadvantage for Western suppliers who do have these regulations to go up against people who are flying unregulated. And I threw this one last bit in, and it's in the paper as well. Marine mineral exploration is not covered at all at this conference, and it should be. It's just exploration. There's now seafloor EM systems, seafloor DC resistivity systems. They're all on autonomous vehicles, on remote vehicles. Um, they've all been used on SMS, which is submarine massive sulfide, or VMS, the conductive targets. Um, but there's also mag and synthetic aperture sonar, um, which produces wonderful images for, for mapping the seafloor. They're good systems for their speed and their low flying for gravity or low floating. Um, but there's problems with attitude control, which is so important in gravity. And of course, pretty expensive to put a, a gravity system down on the seafloor. So what do we see for the next 10 years? I think vector mag should come along. Maybe it's wishful thinking. I've always thought we should have more vector mag out there, especially for small targets. In gamma ray, probably it's going to be mainly small sensors, high res, which will be more environmental engineering. Gravity, we've seen some vector uh, options, and there's going to be more competition for gravity from the gravity gradiometry as they try and extend their bandwidth. I think the combination of the two is really going to be the future. Better sensitivity on the AGG is certainly needed, uh, and shorter wavelength. They sort of come together in a lot of cases. Um, more options, some not ITAR restricted. Some that, where the technology isn't owned by the, the U.S. companies would be good. Smaller system time domain, uh, fixed wing time domain, what we're seeing is small systems used for mapping. Um, really the same thing with frequency domain fixed wing systems. They're going to be mapping tools mostly because they can't compete with the helicopters for resolution and power. And helicopter frequency domain, it will probably continue as is. It's a niche application, gold exploration, engineering work. Really needs to be marketed in the engineering field. And then heli time domain. I think the fierce competition is going to continue. There'll probably be some companies fall out, but because they're all overhead, a lot of them will stick around. Um, and there's a real range of systems from big and high quality to some real small cheapies. Airships, the further testing and experimentation needed, in, uh, but they're too expensive right now. So we'll see where the industry building them takes it. All-in-one systems, we need lower cost systems with mapping suitable resolution. Gravity might not have the resolution for good, a lot of mapping. Drones, while well, we're seeing it in the third world and as exploration, and we'll have to see where the regulations take us in this world. But I think, obviously, drones for a lot of things are the future. I don't know about EM because they have to be so big. And marine, there's going to be continued growth in systems and technology. I think that's a field that's just got to keep going. And one last shot here, one last plug. Uh, this is a new document we've, we've put up. You'll see copies of it around here, basically. There's a lot of bad geophysics out there. We want to educate ourselves and, more importantly, educate our, uh, our clients about these bad players. So if you see one of these, have a look at it. Put it in your booth. Thank you very much. So we'd have time for maybe one uh, question, if there is one. If, if there is one and you can get to the microphone, that would be best. Hi, Charles Baudry. Um, uh, just a question about, uh, can you talk about for a minute on uh, vector, vector mag? Sorry, but the vector mag, magnetics? Oh, vector um, magnetics? I, what is that? It's uh, the system that's there is a squid based. Um, main, a, a lot of mapping applications, it won't help a lot, but small targets, uh, high resolution data. Uh, give you more information about the shape, help you sort out remnants. Um, I think flux gates will probably come along as a lower cost effective tool than the, the squids. But the, so, the so, it, so it can measure bulk, uh, bulk remnants? Sorry? It can measure bulk remnants? Uh, you still always have the problem of, of two or more signals mixed up that you try and got to separate between remnants and the induced magnetic field. So in some cases, they'll probably separate easily. In others, they may be very difficult. But it's, it's more data that will help. It'd always be better than just total field.
Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Yep. Okay. <clears throat>